So today we have with us Professor Dr. Robert Beckhardt. Robert is Professor of Black Theology at the Queen's Foundation and Associate Professor of Black Theology at the VU Amsterdam. He's also a BAFTA award-winning documentary filmmaker and has written and presented many films for the BBC, Channel 4 and Discovery USA. And we are very happy to have him with us today. Um, today's topic will be, is God a white racist? Wake work for theology. So thank you so much for being with us here today, Robert, and I will hand over to you. Thank you very much and good afternoon to everybody. I'm just going to uh, share my screen with you. Uh, there we go. So we should have the picture in uh, the start of it there in front of you. What I hope to do in this session is speak for roughly 30, 40 minutes, um, uh, if I'm uh, quick or, or slow, and that will give us plenty of time for uh, a rest and also questions of reflection um, afterwards. Um, just to let you know, I've just sent uh, uh, Professor van der Boer a, a, a bootleg copy of a film that I just made for the BBC. Um, so uh, I, I'll screen a little bit of it in the middle of this presentation, but if you'd like a copy, uh, you can ask him uh, to, to forward it to you. So I uh, just uh, thought I'd uh, make that clear um, at the start. Okay, let's get going. Is God a white racist? Wake work for black theology. I want to address a problem in British theology, namely Christian theology's history of collusion with racial terror. I will engage the problem through the category of theodicy, and I will do so by appropriating the provocative title of an older work by African-American philosopher William Jones, Is God a White Racist? My use of theodicy will not only be contextualized to address the particularity of black suffering in Britain's colonial and post-colonial context, it will also accommodate mixed methods, a triangulation of theodicy and the Pentecostal episteme of extemporaneous prayer and music. Both of these black church practices enable Pentecostal believers to affirm my academic narration as true because it appeals to their effective knowledge systems in other words, they can think, feel what is prayed and sung in their bodies. I will end by offering a solution to theology's complicity with racial terror that underscores the power of black church music to receptively engage with the history and experience of black suffering and its overcoming. To this end, I will offer a track from my music research project, the Jamaican Bible Remix, as example of creative artistic responses. So let's begin then with the problem. Mainstream British theology has a problem addressing its history of collusion with racial terror. The origins of this crisis lie in a general politics of evasion and a specific Theological, historical amnesia. The general politics of evasion has at its center a revisionist colonial history. The revisionism leads to a colonial Christian history being examined ideologically rather than historically critically. This approach is evident in the way that my generation were introduced to the subject of Christianity and empire. You see, during my schooling, these discourses were mediated by white saviorism. This is the foregrounding of the interventions of great white men who are represented as rescuers of black people in social situations blighted by colonial oppression. Within the particularity of my experience, the two outstanding examples are the 19th century anti-slavery campaigner, William Wilberforce, and the mid 20th century anti-apartheid activist, the Anglican missionary, Trevor Huddleston. If you're into your jazz, uh, Trevor Huddleston gave a little boy on the street a trumpet uh, one day in South Africa in the mid 1970s and said, learn to play this. That was Hugh Masekela. So uh, Trevor Huddleston on the left there is famous not only for his anti-apartheid activism, but also for contributing to um, Afrobeat um, music. 
White saviorism conveniently evades British theological complicity with black suffering and leaves untroubled a national psychosis, a mental disorder caused by the failure to effectively mourn the passing of empire and the demise of British in Britain's international standing on the world stage. Paul Gilroy refers to this uh, mental illness as post-colonial melancholia. A specific counterpart to the general politics of evasion is located in contemporary British theology. The counterpart is a theological gauge, gaze privileging the interests of whiteness. Whiteness is a discursive formation exercising hegemonic control over the historical archives and doing epistemic violence to black and brown bodies by perpetuating a theological malpractice which disavows the entanglement of theology and with racial capitalism and racial terrorism in Britain's British history, both past and present. Whiteness in theology has three interlocking categories of thought and action. First, it constricts the locus of historical inquiry to conveniently evade 500 years of Christian mission in the Caribbean and West Africa. Uh, I'll give you an example here, Dermot McCulloch, the Oxford historian's book on the history of Christianity, 1,000 pages long, only seven pages dedicated to Africa and the diasporan history. Completely evades 500 years of British history. Next, with no engagement with coloniality, th the theological technology, its journals, its books, its conference, its departments, chairs, all conform to the dictates of whiteness. In the last 70 years, for example, in Britain, only two scholarly texts, excluding the work of black theologians, have been published by British white scholars on race and theology. Similarly today, there is not one research center in theology or religious studies addressing the history and impact of Christian racism. Uh, we do have, however, a center, centers across Britain, four, that look at the relationship between theology and animals. Just think of what that means to black and brown people who have been called chattel, beasts of burden. In the modern age, animals get more intellectual attention from theologians than your 500 year history of racial terror, 200 years of Jim Crow, anti-apartheid, colonialism, neo-colonialism, what we call domestic neo-colonialism, no center, no books, no academic inquiry but cats, dogs, sheep, they get attention. Finally, the politics of evasion emboldens, oh, oh um, uh, the politics of ev ev evasion emboldens a latent white Christian nationalism. Say for example, the Ethics of Empire project at Oxford University, uh, uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of pounds has gone into a center in Oxford to demonstrate how good colonialism was. Just have a think about that. Evading history of racial terror, but they have a center called the Ethics of Empire to show how good the British Empire was for all its black and brown people who were subjugated underneath it. But this historical disregard is not just a whiteness issue. It also has implications for black churches. Black Christian traditions are almost as culpable as their white counterparts. Within the history of the diaspora, from the underside of colonial history, the issue to address is a fear of prophetic criticism. Black churches lack the moral courage to hold European Christianity to account for its centuries of brutality and barbarity, and then engaging in one of the greatest cover-ups in academic history. The fear of confrontation is in part a consequence of coloniality, specifically the continuity of a distinctive regime of control. Let me explain. Before the 20th century white saviorism, colonial blacks in the West Indies were exposed to a totalizing religious discourse, which I term salvific whiteness. This describes the folding of racism into Christianity to produce a biopolitical Christianity. Biopolitical Christianity controls the black body in order to secure white power. Black Christians who dared to challenge salvific whiteness while imprisoned, George Lyley, or murdered 
uh, by the state, some sharp. So how do you maintain opposition in the face of salvific whiteness? Well, one retreats into the self. And this is what black Christians did in the colonial period. For example, worship became a site of opposition within the liminality of worship, black, the black body was reimagined as rounded, intuitive, and rational. Well, Tony Penn, the African-American ethicist, describes this phenomenon as black bodies being transfigured from coloniality's fixed objectivity to a black Christian complex subjectivity. Hymnody was a critical conscientization. I mentioned him the because I'm going to deal with music later on. Caribbean Christians sang incarnational songs about God living in black flesh and that their flesh was good in order to affirm the body and worship as an oppositional practice. Yet despite the passing of time, the theological retreat into the self was retained and normalized in black theological imagination. Hence today's aversion to prophetic criticism and moral courage. But not all black Christian spaces are impotent in the, uh, as the black church. In contrast, one contemporary religious context to reject the historical amnesia is the black Christian radical tradition, tradition in Britain. In opposition to white savorism and theologies and, and uh, missionaries as uh, salvific whiteness, Black scholars in the Black radical tradition construct an alternative politics of memory which foregrounds Caribbean slavery as a cornerstone of theological thought and practice. In Black theological studies, this historical commitment is underwritten by two distinct politics of transfiguration. First, a logocentric academic project inside the academy to challenge white theologians to, in the words of W.E.B. Du Bois, do their work over. Uh, Anthony Reddy's work at Oxford, who was uh, earlier on this uh, uh, course, uh, is the, represents the best of this tradition. The second is a Black liberation theopraxis, and this is engaged with cohorts of Black students, Black communities, and Black churches. And this project is on the borderlands of the academy and seeks Black liberation in and through the arts, social movements, and to promote Black re-existence. I place my own work in theology, culture, and media, and campaigning in this second camp. However, despite these pioneering works, the second camp is yet to provide a theological interpretation of Black enslavement, or the ma'afa. In other words, discovering a theory for our praxis. To rectify this neglect, I want to offer a mixed methods theodicy for consideration. So let's move on now. And if that's the problem, uh, uh, what then is the, uh, the, the solution? You know, this problem, which is the neglect of theological reflection on slavery and colonialism, both in black and white context, then what is the solution? I want to talk about the doctrine of God in relation to slavery's racial terror by focusing on the issue of theodicy, the problem of evil. I will mediate the theodicy with the epistemes of extemporaneous black Pentecostal prayer. So there's gonna be some prayer in this and also contemporary black gospel music. So there's gonna be some music uh, in this as well to mediate it. In Christian theology, the classic theod theodical formula in its basic form asks the question, why does God allow evil? The question reflects a logical tension between belief in divine goodness and omnipotence and on the, on the one hand and on the other, the ubiquity of suffering. Suffering, especially unjust suffering or moral evil, denotes oppression, injustice, inequality and the resulting psychological or physical damage. This fundamental question of human existence has many forms and has not escaped the attention of black liberation theology. The historical repercussions of slavery, that is, contemporary racism, colonialism, and domestic neocolonialism fuels a discussion in Black theology on the theoretical and existential dimensions of theodicy. As African American humanist and ethicist Anthony Pinn shows, there are three basic resolutions to the theodical, theolo theodical question in Black theological thought. And these are one, unmerited suffering 
is intrinsically evil yet can have redemptive consequences. Two, God and humans are co-workers in the struggle to remove moral evil. And three, black suffering may result from God being a racist. The first resolution is exemplified in theodicies of redemptive suffering. The positive telos or of redemptive suffering is captured in Caribbean folk culture in the popular refrain, refrain what people make for bad, God makes for good. But this first proposition, I suggest, is not a constructive option for the Caribbean diaspora. This is because it has a history of legitimating the brutality of minorities and women. Redemptive suffering, while not completely outside of theological possibilities, is problematic for people who have been made to think that their suffering is divinely ordained. The second resolution calls for resistance to suffering, that is protest and challenge, and for this reason, suffering is always oriented towards justice. It does not seek, the second position does not seek to answer the question of suffering, but focus on an ethical response. The second position encompasses a long history of black resistance and black radicalism, and has a high point in the Caribbean in the Christian anti-colonial struggles of the 19th century. The second resolution is the most obvious location for a theodicy of slavery and black suffering. The third resolution is a humanist one. God has failed to deliver black people in history and therefore God is partial to whiteness. This third position is the black humanist one and naturally has little traction in the black church. But despite the disinterest of the church, I don't think we should avoid the third position, but engage with it in a constructive way. Rather than dismissing it, we must struggle with it and make it an existential starting point for Black theodicy. After all, Black people are always asking, is God really on our side? For the development of a Black theodicy of slavery, we begin by posing the question, is God a white racist? to the Christian tradition, its presentation of a racist God, which calls into question the goodness of God. I want to consider this new proposal by examining divine racism in African Caribbean history through the medium of Black Pentecostal prayer. Mediating theodicy with extemporaneous prayer facilitates a conversation between ideas about God that have been mobilized to subjugate Black people and the counterclaims of the diaspora in religious history. And prayer in this context is what Ashton Crowley terms Black Pentecostal breath. It is prayer as a critical performative intervention to produce knowledge about the world for transforming ways of thinking and being. So let us pray. Dear God, unlike my forebears in the black church tradition who did not dare equate divine will with racism, I want to talk to you about the undoubted relationship that exists. I do not believe your being is racist, but I do believe that the tradition created in your name in relation to African Caribbean descendants is. My complaint is with the history of Christian racism in which Christians use the curse of harm narrative to inflict harm on black people, said that slavery was divine punishment and made hegemonic the white image of God. God, discrimination against us begins with the interpretation of the Bible, even before European Christians encountered Africans in the age of European expansion, they'd already succumbed to interpretive practices which demonized black flesh. God, while there is no evidence of pseudoscientific racial theory in the ancient narratives of the Hebrew Bible, the remnants of one dangerous interpretation continues to be felt. The narrative is known as the curse of Ham. As Black Biblical Studies demonstrates, despite the real meaning of this passage gesturing towards the ancient taboo of disrespect, an ideological bias in mis led to misinterpretation in Jewish, Christian, and Islamic texts and led to a reading of this text as divine blessing for African servitude. You know, God, 
the original sin of the Christian faith in the Caribbean, which we, which we traditionally associate with earlier chapters in Genesis, was in fact the double fall, folding sin into blackness. God, the curse justifies the punishment of black bodies. It infects the Christian imagination, and it made it possible for some to view Africans as unworthy of equality and at best beasts of burden. A punishment theology underscores the British mission to the new world. Christians Christianized, Christians justified a Christianized slavery. The Anglican priest Morgan Godwin, a witness to the horror of the slave trade, proposed a Christian slavery. He argued that baptism did not imply freedom and that the brutality of enslavement was in fact a saving grace for uncivilized Africans. Lord, some black folk even bought into this idea. But the racialization of the Christian tradition was not accepted by all the descendants of Africa in the Caribbean. There is another side to the, the story of racial terror, and that's resistance and its overcoming. Dear God, I give you thanks, God of justice, that African people survived this terror and in so doing left us a witness, a resistance tradition of their religious cultures. They combated the racial, ter racial terror through a variety of practices, even before the advent of Christian mission, you inspired in Jamaica, the likes of Taki and Nani, African rebel leaders uh, who, who, who formed bands of runaway slaves and armies of resistance, they understood enslavement to be anti-God and the slave system to be occult practice. We also know that with the advent of Christian mission, African Christians rejected the Pauline injunction, slaves obey your masters, and through a variety of hermeneutical strategies that allowed them to either read against the biblical text or challenge uh, disputed passages, they interpreted scripture in ways that could not be curtailed. We locate this oppositional reading in Paul Bogle's use of the Psalms and in the post-slave world in Marcus and Amy Garvey's underlining of the necessity of a black gaze on scripture. For black Christians in revolt, their suffering was not condoned by God, but a corruption of the gospel. Grounded in the experience of your presence in their times of trouble, they learned that you were not immune to the cries of your people, but empathized passively. The co-contextuality of the cross and the lynching tree transformed the Jesus of history into a Christ of liberation. Dear God, I thank you for this cloud of witnesses that watch over us today. Amen. Two contextual theodicies are underlined in the prayer. On the one hand, there is the punishment theodicy of colonial Christianity. Now, as a theodical system, it protects the belief in God's goodness and implicates the black sufferer in their predicament. Although the overdrawn synchronization of sin and suffering in punishment theodicy is not defended in scripture, the enslaved are either cursed by God or damned for misusing their free will. The stated goal of punishment theodicy is rehabilitation, and rehabilitation, a legitimation for subjugation. A punishment theodicy has resonance in the modern world. Arguably, a dynamic equivalent is found in the notion of Black bodies requiring harsher treatment in the medical and criminal justice uh, systems. Uh, they are examples, I suggest, of uh, contemporary repercussions of punishment theodicy. I don't know what it's like in Holland, but in Britain, in medicine, if you're a black woman, you are more likely to be denied, you're in labor, you are more likely to be denied um, pain killing drugs than if you're white or an Asian person. This is reproduced in North America, led to two major medical studies uh, two years ago, partly because celebrities like Beyonce and also the tennis star Serena Williams uh, experienced incredibly difficult births, gave rise to the question why were these black women having difficult births when they were young, fit and healthy, partly because they were being denied the same kind of medical support. What would cause is that? What would cause a doctor to say these black women's bodies, they can bear, they can bear it more, even when it's Beyonce. Her body can bear the pain more than the white woman in the room next door. Punishment theodicy. 
was just it's still there within our consciousness. These bodies need more punishment and don't even start with the criminal justice system. In Britain, we lock up a greater percentage of black men than they do in North America. You know, if you're a black man, you're twice as likely to be uh, uh, imprisoned, 10 times more likely to be stopped and searched, and more likely to be given a harsher sentence for the same crime as your white counterpart. What's behind this? This idea that black bodies somehow require harsher treatment, harsher punishments. It's still there, this punishment theodicy. The second theodicy emerging from the prayer is a resistance tradition, a solidarity theodicy. Solidarity theodicy defends divine omniscience by focusing on human culpability. In this case, humans have free will, which includes the potential for misrule and oppression. The concrete reality of evil is foregrounded, as is resistance to it by any means necessary. The second view maintains faith in a benevolent God, but does not seek to explicitly answer the question of why an omniscient God would permit the unmerited suffering of millions of black and brown people. Instead, it prioritizes mobilizing resources to resist suffering, including racial terror. In sum, an extemporaneous Pentecostal prayer as mediation uh, of a nuanced interpretation of the third position that Anthony Pinn talks about, why he's got a white racist, leads us back to a second position, a divine solidarity model. So let's just summarize the journey before, before we pull it all to, to, to an end, to a close. I've suggested that salvific vific whiteness obfuscates the church's collusion with the slave past. The black church also participates in this politics of denial. As remedy for the black church tradition, I suggest is a theodicy of enslavement. This is the product of exploring a racist Christian tradition rather than an attribute of God. The final task then is to translate solidarity theodicy into a cultural modality in line with the second school, the second black radical school that I mentioned, which is on the borderlands, engaging with the arts and, and with the cultures. And to do so, I appropriate Christina Sharp's wake and wake work as frames for critical creative action. To continue to engage the black church tradition, I want to move beyond the logocentrism of the theological academy and translate the solidarity theodicy of enslavement into a modality for musicality. Music in the black church tradition is the primary medium for disseminating theological ideas about God. Black Pentecostals listen to more songs about God than they read Christian books or engage with videos or, or sermons. Uh, gospel music, therefore, is, is an essential resource for conversing with black church communities and indispensable for articulating uh, a response um, to the uh, issue of divine racism in Christian history. The translation method for turning theodicy into a framework for music production is appropriated from the literary theorist Christina Sharp and her conceptualization of the wake and wake work based on her analysis of the meaning of the slave ship. Reflecting on the meaning of the slave ship for a contemporary black life or living in the wake of the slave ship, Sharp interprets the wake through the material metaphors of the ship, the hold and the weather. The wake of the ship signifies the legacies of slavery in the modern world. She's just saying we live in the wake of slavery. The ripples of the slave ship are still very much with us and therefore we have to contemplate that. That has to be in our consciousness. That's our ground zero. The hold of the ship is still with us. The floating dungeon, it has contemporary, where, where else do they lock up black people disproportionately? Criminal justice system. Why the work of, um, uh, did I put it in here? I put it in here. The work of um, Alexander is so important. The new Jim Crow, looking at the way in which the 13th Amendment basically means that slavery was never abolished. It was simply evolved into the criminal justice system. The hold, she argues, is still very much with her. And then finally, the weather of the slave ship becomes a metaphor for talking about the normalized, racialized environs of the West. That is the total climate that produces premature black death, whether social, physical, um, or psychological as normative. Think, for example, of COVID-19 and disproportionality. I don't know if some worked out in Holland, but in Britain, black people, brown people have been have had a higher rate of uh, mortality, more likely to be infected, more likely not to get a place in hospital, more likely to die. Same reproduced in North America. So you know, let's raise the curtain, raise the veil 
on the way in which racism has become normalized in the healthcare system, normalized in terms of housing and, and accommodation, um, uh, which, are, which are two primary factors involved in COVID-19 spread um, within the UK. In response to the wake, uh, Sharp, exam Sharp promotes wake work, what she calls sites of artistic production and resistance consciousness. So what I want to do is fold solidarity theodicy within wake work um, to produce four modalities, four modes for gospel music production, because as I've mentioned, music is the way to engage and articulate the uh, solidarity theology, engaging with the black church. So what should a solid, what should this music then look like, sound like? Well, first, solidarity theodicy must resist, reside in the wake, specifically engage with the legacies of white saviorism and salvific whiteness. It must speak, speak truth to power. Second, solidarity theodicy must identify the theological traces which maintain the Christian hold, that is Christian theology's captivity to oppressive systems and practices. It must confront the weather, that is engage with the Christian climate of racialized uh, oppression. I was going to give you a quick example early on, but I forgot to show you from the film. I made a film that went out two weeks ago um, for BBC Panorama, which dealt with the weather. We looked at racism within the Church of England. The objective was to get the Church of England to change a couple of policies. That's what you make the films for. It's action reflection. They changed them overnight. So we didn't have to wait until the morning. They watched it and changed them overnight. This is just a, an excerpt from the film. The film was, um, uh, uh, I was, I'm not pretty enough or, old, um, or young enough now to present programs. So they get either celebrities or journalists. So we have the journalist Clive Myrie uh, present this one. I appear in the film to do the, to do the links, uh, the, the, uh, the, the critical stuff. But this is Clive Myrie in, in, interviewing a woman who used to head up the church's um, uh, anti-racism. She talks about, she gave a list of complaints. This is one that I thought was really quite shocking of uh, what took place within the church. A really shocking incident was a young black man who received a picture of a banana, but that banana had his head superimposed upon it, and underneath it said banana man. That is a deeply offensive and deeply racist image. He took it to HR and he did file a grievance, and the decision was that it wasn't, it wasn't racist. And that person left and he received a very small compensation. However, he was forced to sign a non-disclosure agreement. Yeah, so what we wanted basically was them to uh, stop these non-disclosure agreements and stop people talking about the racism that they'd, they'd experienced. And listen, we didn't have to wait until the morning papers, it was done um, overnight. So that's the reason why we engage with this kind of artistic practice to, to do this actual research methodology, but to engage with the world outside. So how does this then work out in terms of the theodicy of slavery and translating that into creative artistic practice, Christina Sharp's way? Well, in conclusion, uh, I'm not expecting all gospel artists to accept this template for creative action, but I'm committed to providing practical examples of what this new trajectory might sound like and look like. And I end with an example from the album, the Jamaican Bible remix, the track Payback. Payback is an example of wake work. The song reflects on the wake of slavery, namely how do we um, deal with this suffering in a redemptive way? That is, how do we impose restorative justice and engage in questions of recompense? It takes seriously this trap to hold and by dealing with the continuity and discontinuities of racial terror in the modern world. And finally, it takes stock of the weather, the climate of racial justice in 21st century uh, Britain. So this is, a, uh, this, this is a single from the album. It's uh, one of the music videos. What I do here is I made a film about reparations for slavery. We use the visuals for that. But the audio is a cut and paste of a radio program I went on to defend the, uh, the film that we made. There was also, in academia, we have one famous reggae star who became a sociologist. So I asked him if he'd be on the track just because he was a famous reggae artist, but he's now a sociologist. In, in London. I asked him to be on the track, so he appears on it and does these a uh, little bit of rapping. So I'm just going to end with this and, and then we are we are done. He 
Introducing Dr. Leslie Henry lyrics on the Jamaican Bible remix. Paul letter to file, man. Should Britain pay reparations and make a formal apology to the descendants of slaves? Much of our imperial and business strength has its origins in the slave trade of the 18th and early 19th century, and the academic Robert Beckford argues in a new television programme that the empire should pay back. If him did do nothing wrong to you, or him owe you, we pay you back. Pay you back. If him did do nothing wrong to you, or him owe you, we pay you back. Pay you back. Let's start with uh, the scale of slavery. You compare it in the programme to the Nazi Holocaust. For several decades of the slave trade, it was cheaper to bring in Africans, work them to death, and then replace them. So we're looking at genocidal conditions on the Caribbean plantations. The complexity of our condition is what you fail to comprehend. Historically turned into chattels, beast of burden, less than men, thinking the only way to survive is to pretend to be you, mocking our very existence, animals in your human zoo. If him did do nothing wrong to you, or him owe you, we pay you back. Pay you back. If him did do nothing wrong to you, or him owe you, we pay you back. Pay you back. There are two um, sort of almost instant default defences made by a lot of British people when this is raised. The first is that actually the slave trade was something that was driven from Africa itself, that it was uh, Muslim uh, Arab slave traders uh, moving down south and that people in the sort of centre center ground of, of uh, West Africa in particular were behind the slave trade. What we focus on is what the British did. I'm not that concerned with what one ethnic group did to another ethnic group in Africa. I'm interested in how the British participated in it, the huge profits that were made, and the incredible economic benefit to this country, and also the underdevelopment of Africa, and more so the brutalization of African people in the Caribbean. African cultures disrespected, educated against ourselves is why we wind up disaffected. The saddest case in the saddest place, even these words leave a bitter taste in my mouth, because as an African, to you I'm human waste. If him did do nothing wrong to you, or him owe you, we pay you back. Pay you back. If him did do nothing wrong to you, or him owe you, we pay you back. Pay you back. The second defence mechanism, people say, is, well, it was Britain uh, which uh, ended the slave trade. It was, it, was, it was Wilberforce, and then it was the Royal Navy, and that Britain's got a lot to be proud of in stopping the slave trade. When I was taught history, I was always told to approach it from a multidimensional perspective, to look at what happened in the subjugated history, not just read history like TV history from the good and the great. In the Caribbean, they talk about the slaves who ended slavery. The fact that there were rebellions across the Caribbean in the 1830s that made slavery economically impossible and just not viable. So we know that Britain ended the trade in 1807. We know that the slavery was ended in 1834, 1838. It took a little bit of a while for it to work through. But we cannot discount the influence and the work of Africans in the Caribbean who helped to undermine slavery. So it's a much more complex picture. Trying to confuse, telling the world you set us free. Good old England, don't you know? We were anti-slavery. The Clapham sex should get respect because they showed a lot of class. Another historical distortion like your William Wilberforce. If him did do nothing wrong to you, or him owe you, we pay you back. Pay you back. If him did do nothing wrong to you, or him owe you, we pay you back. Back. And probably most controversially, you say there should be payback, there should be reparation. I believe that as a mature, sophisticated, post-industrialized nation that we are, we're in a very strong and dynamic position, and to be able to apologize for the past is not a sign of weakness, but a sign of strength. And I also believe that things like compensation and an apology are psychosocial in their impact. They help to heal the nation and enable people to move on. There must be repay for them is done. Repair for them is done. It's not a foreign concept. I mean, Israel is a state of reparations for damage done. 
justifiably so. The Africans, victims of the slave trade, we must demand repay for damage done. It may take many forms, but the concept is legitimate and the need is great. Speak our truth in redemption songs. Reparations transcends money. It's about repairing historical wrongs. Britain as a nation needs to face one brutal fact. We need more than just a band-aid to put the African on the map. If him did do nothing wrong to you, okay. or him to you, you, we pay you back. Pay you back. If him did do nothing wrong to you, or him to you. So that's an example of doing wake work and folding um, the Odyssey. Uh, an ethical theodicy of slavery into artistic practice to then produce wake works which lived in the wake of this history but also seeking to redeem and atone for it. The figures that you saw going along the screen were the figures that we, we got experts to calculate how much Britain would have to pay in compensation to the English-speaking Caribbean as reparations. It turned out to be seven trillion, 7.5 trillion pounds. This was in 2005. So add on interest um, into today, and you're looking at something like 10 trillion pounds. Now, the British economy only turns over 3.53 uh, trillion pounds. You get a sense of how much is actually owed for uh, to um, for the debt that that is owed to these enslaved people. Thank you very much.